Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. Uh, here it is on a, on a given uh, Tuesday, and we're um, we're examining the community. So this is Community Matters, and today we want to talk with NAMI. That's the National Alliance on Mental Mental uh, Mental Health. Mental. Well, I'm, let me ask for a definition from the <laughs> the executive here who runs the organization. That's Kumi McDonald. Hi, Kumi. Welcome to the show. Hi, Jay. Thank you for having me today. Okay, so it's N-A-M-I, it's N-A-M-I of Hawaii. It's part of a national yes. organization. Tell me about it and uh, extend the acronym so, uh, acronym so I know what it is. We are the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI, and we are uh, a part of the largest grassroots mental health organization in the nation. We have over 600 affiliates across the country and we have the state organization which is in hawaii we service all of the islands but we do have localized um programs specifically for oahu Kauai, maui and the big island and what we do is we, right. our grassroots meaning that we started off with people wanting to help other people who are affected by mental illness well let's define mental illness you know because um um you know, I, as I tell you before the show, I believe that everybody has a touch. Nobody, we're mammals, and so we're biochemical, you know, animals, and uh, no, no two are the same, and no two are exactly, you know, ideal. Um, and everybody has uh, their own eccentricities, and sometimes that's diagnosable, and sometimes not. And it's also a dynamic; it changes in your lifetime. And get better and get worse. So when you say mental illness, what are you talking about? What's the spectrum there? Well, mental illness is an actual illness about behaviors, how the mind works, and it's often not visible. There's no blood test that you can specifically take. But we know that when your behaviors and your thinking affects the way you live your life, then it becomes a, a illness. But like we try to educate people is that all of us are affected by mental health. And it's a spectrum of one to four saying, some of us have a little bit of a sleeping issue. We might have a little bit of stress. We might have a little bit of um, anxiety here and there. That might be a stage one, and that's majority of us. We are all affected by that. But when it becomes a two or a three or a four, especially three or four, you'll notice it severely when people are, you know, having hallucinations or so depressed they can't even leave their bedroom, or they have other types of. Um, you know, exaggerated moods, then we know that it becomes a serious mental illness. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to say, hey, everybody's affected. Let's all stay mentally healthy before it becomes a serious illness. Mm -hmm. Can you can you come back from a serious illness? Uh, I Absolutely. suppose there are drugs that'll help you and all that. Go ahead. Absolutely. And what NAMI is about is that there is absolute hope for recovery. Now, um, mental illnesses, we have to treat them like an illness. And that's the whole point of what we do is we're trying to tell, tell people, educate people that it's not being weird. We don't call them crazy. We're saying they're just people just like you and me that might have been going through some kind of struggle and it got a little bit bad and it, we just need a little bit more help and medication. There's therapies, there's cognitive behavioral therapy, art therapy, music therapy, journaling, support groups. There's so many different things that can help um, people in their recovery journey. Faith plays a role. Also staying connected to their communities. Also um, new research is showing that there is more nutrition um, based evidence that Changing the way we eat can help with mental health issues, but we see it over and over. People, even with some serious, serious mental illnesses, 
live productive lives once they get on medication or go through treatment can go on to have relationships have wonderful careers be contributors to our society in fact many of our board members happen to be people living in recovery from mental illness including myself i live in recovery from depression and anxiety and and i'm not ashamed to say that that there is hope for recovery have you seen that movie joker it uh, came on no, uh, recently on Netflix. It's a, it's the story of somebody who's really got yes. serious mental illness problems. And in the end, he just, he goes, he goes off the wall. Um, but it strikes me and I wanted to pose this to you. There are a lot of people in our community, in our world, in the country, in the world who are really off the wall and uh, they're not, they're not taking their medicine. They may have been prescribed medicine that could help mm -hmm. them, but they don't take the medicine. And it strikes me. There's no, specific structure or system to follow up with them, to make sure that they're in the middle of the channel, that they're taking the medicine and they're not acting out. Um, is NAMI concerned with that? Yes, absolutely. So there has been a bill that was passed in 2019 to change the language for the assisted community treatment and assisted community treatment or a assisted outpatient treatment, they call in other parts of the country, but AOT or ACT, what we call it in Hawaii, will get, it's, a, it's a program where we get the judicial system, we get families involved, we get their clinicians, doctors, therapists, all of them involved. It's a community treatment program and it will be court ordered where somebody who is severely mentally ill who haven't been taking their medication or been fighting treatment will now have a commu um, community treatment that it's not just one person or one agency, but it's a partnership where we get everybody involved and get this person the help that they need. And this is something that is just starting to change in Hawaii. We were gonna do a, a wonderful training workshop on this in March 30th, but because of COVID-19, we had to postpone it, but we will hold this event where we're, um, mainland trainers are gonna be coming in to train our judges, our mental health courts, lawyers, public defenders, advocates, clinicians, hospitals, family members, people who care anything about this situation, how this program can take effect in the state of Hawaii and how mm. we can implement it. And it's a one year program. It's not just one day training, but the training will happen. And then they're gonna follow up with um, several other meetings to make sure that we have certain um, things step, set in place. And so we will have that sometime later this year. Um, and again, this will be a partnership with NAMI, with Mental Health America, and we have some great sponsors who are sponsoring us for that. Why, why do we care, Kumi? Why do we care? I mean, like, um, you know, we don't put that much effort into helping people with dermatological problems. Why do we care about people with mental illness problems? Is it, is it a, uh, why is it a community concern? It's a community concern because it affects one in five people. And that means it affects your family member or a loved one or your neighbor, a coworker. And also, 46% of all human beings have been affected by a mental health condition at least once in their life. That's about half of us. So let's say, if, even if you have never experienced a mental health condition, I'm sure one of your family members has. Uh, I can say I have, and ha at least half of my family members have. So it does affect us. And then if you say, well, none of my family or anyone I know has been affected, well, what about the person that you work with? What if that person didn't show up for work because they're depressed or they have anxiety and that workload gets put onto you or your company business is not functioning as well because somebody with mental health issues didn't do their work and trickle effect. So it does affect our economy. What about people on the streets, people who are um, homeless, people who are on um, addicted to um, substance use, these people are also affected by mental illnesses and you know they could be trespassing or they could be doing things um, on your property that you're not happy with and so it does affect us as a nation it does affect us as a community mm. 
Um, let's let's move to coronavirus because coronavirus exacerbates it. I mean, we talking before. I mean, if I threw you in Lubyanka prison for a few months, in uh, uh, Arthur Kessler's book uh, Darkness at Noon, uh, you would you would lose your rationality pretty quickly. You'd lose your identity. You'd become unproductive and worse. Um, and so, uh, if I give you a hard time, if I give you a lot of stress, if I give you a lot of unknowns and risks and threats, what have you, um, you know, you have, you're at risk for an exacerbation of whatever might avail you, or or things that haven't ailed you before, but now you you you're into uh, another world of mental health. Um, so here we are, coronavirus. People worried. They're worried sick about getting it. Worried sick? Do you like that? They're worried sick about getting it. Um, they're stressed, they're stressed for themselves, their families, for their business, I mean, everything. And they don't know mm -hmm. the, the fear of the unknown. This is a very stressful time. Not only here on the mainland, certainly in, in, a, in a hot, hot spot like New York, that, oh my goodness, um, and in various places in the world. So um, this, to me, this is an, an exacerbation, an increase in, in mel mental illness. It, it, it's predictable. It's it's understandable. It's part of the human condition. Um, what can NAMI do about that? What is NAMI doing about that? Mm -hmm. So mental health, we're not probably not as healthy as we'd like to be with coronavirus. We're not getting the sunlight we need. We're not getting all the exercise we need. We're not getting the physical contact that we need to stay mentally healthy. Routine is not there. So there's a lot of people under a lot of duress, lots of stress, a lot of fear. And so what we've noticed is we have had a lot of people concerned calling us and saying, how, how do I get help? What do I do? And so NAMI has been really at the forefront we're so i'm so proud of nami as a nation and even in our tiny little state of hawaii so we are online we're providing online support group we're uh, uh, providing online workshops on how to deal with this stress so maybe it's not going to be a mental illness but you're under a little bit of stress like we all are and so what we want to do is we want to teach you skills to stay mentally and emotionally healthy. And so our first workshop that we had last week was on coping skills with COVID-19. How do we stay um, st stress-free? How do we stay mentally healthy? And that one, a really great turnout. And then the next one we're gonna offer on the 24th will be art and music therapy. How to use creativity to cope with our stresses. And that's gonna be a great workshop as well. And then again, we have, support groups that meet Wednesday at noon. You can find all that on our website, NAMI Hawaii. This is all online, org. right? This is all yes. by remote, right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And then well, we also let's, provide phone phone support. If you want to call us or email us, we're available too. That's good. Is that 24 by 7? No, I wish, but um, our helpline on the national level, I believe, has a little bit of a longer hour. Locally, we answer phones 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Monday through Friday. You know, the thing about being in isolation is, I mean, it's, it's a, a deprivation of our normal life uh, routine, ex expectancy for, you know, engagement with the community and with other people and so forth. And I, I'm sure that it works on everybody to be isolated. Probably works more on people who are alone, you know. Uh, it's interesting. My own my own experience. Um, I'm not unhappy doing this because I can I can talk to you and others. I can engage and I can learn. Uh, this is this is a benefit for me and, and it keeps me real. Um, but there are a lot of people that don't have that opportunity. And you talk about mm -hmm. phone calls. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, at night um, when I'm you know not working on think tech, I will. Pardon me if I, you do a little therapy on me right now. Uh, I will make a call <laughs> to a friend of mine, or he will call me or she, and uh, I will spend an inordinately long period of time on the phone. I mean, I haven't talked to people for such lengthy calls since I was a teenager. Um, usually my telephone calls are very quick, you know, just the facts. But <clears throat> in this case, I feel like I need to do that. I need to have this social experience there. And I also need, I also think that if I didn't have this, I would be missing something. And I also think 
that if somebody else was isolated and didn't have anybody to call, that would be corrosive experience and yes. not, not healthy. What, what do you think about all of that? Absolutely. Part of mental health is being connected to our community. Science shows over and over that even people with depression, which is the, you know, one of the biggest mental health issues in the nation is that just being with other people is so important. And so through this coronavirus and the shutdown, being available to, you, there's so many platforms. You can do Zoom, there's free versions, there's Facebook, there's um, Google Meet. Um, there's so many different ways to connect visually, right? FaceTime, uh, Skype. And so when you were able to see people's faces, you really do feel that sense of connection. And it's hard because your routine is, you know, shifted, but you have to fight hard to try to get some of that back. And so even for me personally, I mean, there there were times it was very stressful. There were times when I was very lonely, but I'm back on doing Zoom meetings with board members. We're doing Zoom for our support group. We have the workshop that's coming up. I also do it for my Sunday school class. I do it for my Sunday church service. I'm online. So there's so many um, ways for me to connect. Now that I'm a little, I'm a little exhausted with um, meeting people so much on Zoom because now I feel like, wow, I am interacting with people even more now, I feel, because everybody's available now. At, they're at home and they have more flexible schedules. So, you know, it, it is a good, um, way to connect. I'm not saying it's perfect. We still need physical touch and hugging each other, the Aloha spirit, but this is a great way to stay connected. And we're trying to give everyone that opportunity to try it out. And so please mm. join us. <clears throat> you, you, know, know? I, you know, in the past, in the past, um, you wanted to have a meeting with somebody or just, just meet person, a person, the meeting would start with a handshake or a touch. Okay? And when the meeting was over, it would end with a handshake or a touch. Well, somewhere in there a few weeks ago, you know, this is before we went isolated, uh, we stopped touching. We stopped handshaking. That was, you know, a bad, bad idea, you know, and catch something. <clears throat> okay. And my, my worry about this is that going forward, when we come out the other side, when we resolve the problem from a medical point of view, people are still going to be slightly paranoid about touching. They won't want to do a handshake. They're going to be slightly paranoid about surfaces and washing their hands and all, all those things and, and looking directly into somebody close, you know, within six feet and having a conversation with somebody where the micro, micro droplets can get into your respiratory. They're going to be paranoid about that. I mean, for a long time, maybe for a whole generation. I know I'm going to be thinking those thoughts because I'm never sure. Now, when is an absolutely uh, effective uh, vaccine, maybe you could convince me. But for a long time, these lessons of social isolation are going, and this is going to change our lives, isn't it? Is this mm -hmm. going to affect our ability to, you know, retain our mental health? Well, I think the, hu I think humans are um, amazing. We are going to find ways to get around it. We're going to find ways to cope and communicate with each other, show our love and support and connection in other ways. And, you know, the mind is a very powerful thing. And if you can connect via Zoom or Skype or FaceTime and see someone's face and say, oh, that's the person that I care about. And then give yourself a hug while you think about them. <laughs> You're going to still release some of those endorphins, right? You're going to still release some of those happy chemicals. So I think we can get around it. It's not per it's not a perfect world, but I think we're the human condition is a very we're strong. We're strong. And I think we're going to survive. I believe that. OK, but some of us are going to have a problem. And I'm sure you hear about those problems. <laughs> People living alone, yes. <clears throat> people are isolated. They don't have that kind of stimulus. They don't have that, you know, the, the interaction. Um, and they probably begin to decline emotionally. Um, <clears throat> what happens to them? What's the classical story? You must have some of these on the phone. What's the classical story where they're alone and they begin to, you know, decline, decompensate, what have you, and even get depressed, okay, mm -hmm. and even think mm -hmm. suicidal thoughts, possibly even do suicide. 
Uh, how does that track work? Well, you know, just because someone is alone, just because someone is isolated doesn't necessarily mean that they will have depression or anxiety or any other mental health issues per se, because some people just are born genetically very strong. You know, just like some people are predispositioned for heart disease, you could be an Olympic athlete and still come down with cancer or a heart attack. So it's just sometimes that's just the cards you're dealt with. So, you know, not saying that everyone who's isolated will have mental health issues, but I would say that if people start to go downwards, it, the first ones that will notice, people will notice is um, your family members and, or your close friends. Because the person with a mental health issue very rarely will say, "I'm something's wrong with me. It's very rare for people to be able to catch themselves uh, once they get to a certain level. And so it's usually the family members who will call us and say, my family member is depressed. My family member has psychosis. Or my family member is having delusions. What do I do? And then that's when we step in. And what we provide is um, an eight-week education class for these loved ones how to we teach these loved ones com, how to communicate with your pr loved one with a mental illness how do you do you, this remotely now is this something you can do remote we're not quite there yet we we just had our class start in january and we were not able to finish um but we are gonna try to continue on and we just started our online support groups last week so give us a little bit of time and we will go well, online. I would predict yeah, that we, this is one of those things that come, comes out the other side of the pipe. I would predict just as doctors are, are going to be more uh, amenable to diagnosing mm -hmm. patients uh, about things they can see and maybe have the patient test himself or herself. Um, the same thing, there, there'll be, there'll be, uh, there'll be psychiatrists or psychologists and, uh, you know, mental health workers, if you will, who will give treatment and solace uh, on, on the internet uh, in a conversation just like this. In fact, I feel better just, just talking with you, Kumi. But let me, <clears throat> let, oh, me, let me ask you one last question. We have a few minutes left and I wanna get into this. <clears throat> um, it was predictable that if you coop up a bunch of family members or people who are living together, called partners, what have you, um, that there would be arguments and um, there would be d disagreements and there would be tension and there would be mm -hmm. violence, you know, domestic violence. And there's been plenty of talk about increases in domestic violence because mm -hmm. people are cooped up and they can't, they can't fashion a relationship that can, that, you know, that can coexist in a, in a cooped up space. Um, what about that? Uh, have you heard of that? Can you speak to that? Uh, what is the process and what is the solution? Well, I I don't have a really detailed answer because again, I'm not a specialist in that, but the one thing that I can say is if we can take away some of those stressors, if we can work on coping skills, like if I'm irritated, what can I do about it before I hit somebody or yell, what can I do about it? And those are the things that we're trying to educate our community is like, before I hit someone, maybe I can journal about it. Maybe I can go and do some music therapy. Maybe I can do some art. Maybe I can listen to music, whatever works for me. And we try to get people to create their own little toolkit, you know, and put in it what works for you. So for me, it's I have essential oils. I have a little chocolate bar. I have um, supplements. If I get really stressed, sometimes I want to take some, you know, herbal supplements. Or sometimes I just want a hot cup of tea, take a shower, go for a walk. So meditation apps. I have all these meditation apps that I go to every day. I do my prayer and do my uh, Bible reading. All of these things that help me deal with my stressors so that I don't take it out on somebody else. And then if we could take care of our stressors, if we can figure out good coping skills, we won't run to drugs, we won't run to alcohol, we won't run to other people or bad behaviors. And that's what our goal is. You know, one of the things that's been on the tube, um, you can hardly escape it, is the tragedy of uh, losing a family member to 
um, you know, the, the uh, coronavirus uh, in a hospital setting where you cannot participate. You can't say farewell. I mean, they use uh, iPads once in a while, and often the doctor's been a number of articles about that. The doctor steps in, and he acts as a proxy for the family, and and he hears the you know last comments of somebody on a ventilator who is who is not making it. Um, but I think the, the most frustrating thing of all, of course, is the family member who is close with you know with the patient, but who cannot share anything with the patient really. Uh, mm -hmm. for the last week or maybe more or two weeks of, um, of the patient's life. Now, that's mm -hmm. real stress. Mm -hmm. That is breaking all the, the social rules for that person. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine him getting, or her getting really upset about it. Um, what about them? Uh, what can we do? What can they do so as not to carry around a scar forever by virtue of this separation and death phenomenon? That is what NAMI is about. We're about community and about giving people hope, whether you're the person with the mental health issue or whether you're the family member or you care, you're the loved one that supports that person. And what we do is we provide support and we build communities. And so we have these community support groups for family members and we have support groups for people living in recovery from mental health issues. So whatever side of the coin you're on, we have a support group for you. There's also grieving support groups. We don't provide them specifically, but they're available and you can find those on the webs, on the internet somewhere. But there are places where you can connect and more than ever, we need to support one another and say, hey, we're here for you. And we're about sharing stories about the lived experience. And when you hear the story of somebody else and it gives you a little bit of hope, it gives you a little comfort knowing you're not in this all by yourself. Okay, um, that's that's uplifting. What is your website, Kumi? NamiHawaii.org. Even okay. if you Google us and just put in Mental Illness Hawaii or Nami Hawaii, it will pop up. Thank you. Kumi McDonald, um, the Executive Director of Nami Hawaii, thank you so much for coming down and joining us. I hope to talk to you again. Uh, stay safe. Thank you, Jay. Aloha. Thank you. I'll...